The following is an example problem of a wood steel composite beam under bending. Now in this case we are going to have bending across the vertical axis. Often we have bending on the horizontal axis, but we'll go across the vertical centroidal axis. In order to analyze this situation, we find it easy to transform either the wood or the steel into one or the other, so that we have one consistent material throughout through which we calculate the area moment of inertia, I. Now I is only one aspect of the stiffness of the beam. The other aspect is E. If it were consistent material, we would simply multiply E times I and we would have the stiffness of the beam. Since we have two different materials, we have two different moduli of elasticity, so it's difficult to calculate the stiffness. But if we modify the one material's area moment of inertia in exact proportion to the difference in the moduli of elasticity, then we will have a stiffness that accurately represents the beam. We find the ratio between the two moduli of elasticity. We call this ratio n, and in this case it will be the modulus for the wood over the modulus for the steel. You could use it in the other way, that's fine, you'll come out with the same answer. Here we can cancel out the units and this we end up with 1 to 15 is our ratio. So we will take the wood and make one of its two dimensions one fifteenth of its original size. Now the choice is which dimension are we going to choose? Because we're bending about the vertical centroidal axis, we must change the vertical dimension of the wood. If we did not, then we would be changing the location of the centroid of the axis, or at least the distance of the centroid of the wood with the centroid of the entire shape. If we simply change the vertical dimension of the wood, that distance won't change and we can simplify our calculations. So we're going to redraw this cross-section. Here's the redrawn cross-section. Note that the height of the wood has now changed to 4 fifteenths of an inch instead of its original 4 to account for the difference in the modulus of elasticity. Now we can continue and calculate the area moment of inertia based on that. We have five elements. One, two, three, four, five. All of them are rectangular. We can calculate those fairly easily. One and five 
are identical and 2 and 4 are identical. 3 has the same nominal air moment of inertia as 1 and 5 do but has no distance from the centroidal axis so it will have zero for its parallel axis component. So we will calculate these parts of the area moment of inertia, add them up, and in fact this is a significant portion of the problem. So for one, the nominal area moment of inertia formula is its height, in this case 4 fifteenths of an inch, times its base cubed over 12. And that goes for all five of the elements. Its height is 4 fifteenths of an inch, its base is 2 inches, divide by 12 and we get 0 0.178 inches to the fourth. For element 2, we have 0 0.005 inches to the fourth. Element 3 is the same as 1 and 4 is the same as 2, and 5 is the same as 1 and 3. And the area of element 1 is 4 fifteenths times 2 inches, so that makes 8 fifteenths inches squared, and its distance from the centroidal axis we should actually indicate as x prime squared is the distance from its centroid to the centroid of the entire shape which is luckily right in the middle. So we have half of 2 which is 1 plus half of 2 which is 1 plus 1 quarter. So this distance is 2.2 5 inches. So we take the area, 8 fifteenths square inches, multiply by the square of 2.25 inches, and we have 2.70 inches to the fourth. And for the steel, it has a distance from its centroid to the centroid of the entire shape of one half, which is half of two, plus half of a quarter. So halfway into the shape, we've got one plus half of a quarter, which is one and one eighth. Its area is four inches by a quarter inch, which is easily one square inch. The square of one and an eighth inches. This yields 1.266 square inches. Now element 3 has a centroid that is right on the centroidal axis, so its distance to the centroidal axis is zero, so it would simply multiply by zero. 4 and 5 are identical to 1 and 2, 2 and 1 respectively. 
So the total contribution from element 1 is 2.878 inches to the fourth. Element 2 is 1.271 inches to the fourth. Element 3, 178. And as we add it all up, we get 8.476 inches to the fourth, and that's with a little bit of round off error, but that won't matter. Now that we have the transformed area moment of inertia, we can come back and apply our stress equation. Stress equals mc over i for a consistent cross-section in bending. What we're trying to find is the bending moment that's allowed for our allowable stresses. So we can solve for that. m equals stress times area moment of inertia over C. Now, the area moment of inertia that we're considering is the transformed area moment of inertia. And we can use this equation with an untransformed section, in this case the steel we'll have to do something different when it comes to the wood. So we'll make this the allowable stress for the steel times the transformed moment of inertia all over C of the steel. Now C is the distance from the centroidal axis to the outermost fiber, in this case the outermost fiber of the steel, not the entire thing because the steel is only uh, sandwiched in between the wood. So we're only considering the steel at this point. So we have 22 KSI times 8.1. Four seven six inches to the fourth all over C of the steel and that is one inch from the center wood portion so half of two plus the entire distance one quarter inch of the steel one point two five inches. Now let's take care of our units. This is per square inch so I can cancel that out. So I got two square inches on two inches on the bottom and then another inch on the bottom. So we got three inches on the bottom. Cancel that out with that and we end up with kip inches. We have 149.2 kip inches or 12.43 kip feet. Looking at the wood, we must transform the section back into its original size. This is because we're looking at stress, which is force over area. So we need to have the original area back. So I'm going to multiply the allowable stress for the wood times the transformed 
airy moment of inertia all over the ratio n times that distance c for the wood, which is going to be different. So the allowable stress for the wood is 2 ksi. Moment of inertia is 8.476 inches to the fourth. N is 1 15th. And CW is the distance from the center here all the way over to here. So we've got 1 inch, 1 and a quarter, plus 2 is 3 and a quarter inches. And this, of course, is unitless. So let's take care of those. Kips per square inch. So I've got 2 inches on the bottom, 1 inch more on the bottom. So I've got 3. Cancels that out. So I've got that left. And those units are consistent. And we ended up with 78.2 kip inches or 6.52 kip feet. In this case, failure would begin with the wood. The minimum moment to go over the allowable stress in the wood is six and a half kip feet, whereas the minimum moment to go over the allowable stress in the steel is twelve and a half kip feet. The key differences in a composite beam versus a beam of homogeneous material is we must first transform the cross-section based on the ratio of one modulus of elasticity to the other modulus of elasticity. It does not matter which one you use. In fact, if we had done the steel on top of the wood and transformed the steel instead of the wood, it probably would have been easier in this case. One thing that this transformation also requires is that when the stress equation is introduced, we must transform the wood, or whatever was transformed, wood in this case, back into its original size. So dividing by 1 15th brought this back into its original size so that the stress could be distributed over the proper area. Much of the work actually went into calculating the transformed area moment of inertia.